Good morning. It's 11.07 Korea time. So we're actually only two minutes behind our anticipated begin. Not bad for the first ever live interactive video and audio webcast. My name is Robert Dickey and with me is Dr. David Noonan of the University of Hong Kong, one of ELT's most notable celebrities, authors, and personalities in particularly in Asia, but across the globe. Dr. Noonan, thanks for being with us today. Good morning. It's a pleasure. Well, I'm glad it's a pleasure. You've had a busy week. I have indeed, yes. Uh, you mentioned in your broadcast yesterday, which was viewed live by some, and this is interesting. Ah, the plenary is occurring at the same time. At the same time that we're doing this audio cast, there is a uh, plenary presentation occurring in another room. So it makes things a little interesting. But you had a busy week, and in your presentation, which was live on Saturday at 5 p.m. and available for live viewing and was recorded, and we hope many of our guests have seen that presentation, you mentioned that you made a quick trip to Sweden. Yes, that was probably the... the the most curtailed trip I've ever made. I left Hong Kong at about one o'clock on Friday morning and uh, arrived in Stockholm at lunchtime on Saturday. Uh, on, on Friday, gave my plenary at uh, ten o'clock on Saturday morning. Flew back to Hong Kong via London and was back in time, uh, back in Hong Kong in time for Sunday lunch. So. <laughs> well, that's good. That means you missed no classroom teaching time, I, right? That's right. Uh, absolutely. A dedicated teacher. Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, one of the features of Dr. Noonan is that he not only talks about teaching ELT, but he teaches English language learners on a regular basis. And he also teaches uh, the graduate level education programs, including a program which is thoroughly online. That's right, yes. That's been an interesting, um, interesting uh, adventure. We've been running that MA for about six years now, and so we were really, really were cutting edge at the, at the beginning uh, stages. Uh, in fact, we do have the students over a two-year period complete their, their master's degree online, um, and then they also have to attend a residential program, and so once during their, their degree or twice during their degree, they have to come together and to do an intensive course, and uh, the next residential is next week in San Diego. So, uh, oh, San Diego's my anyway. hometown. Oh, great. It's a wonderful place. It's a good place to be. We try and pick attractive places to make it worthwhile for students who have to come from all over the world. Um, last year was Hawaii, which wasn't bad either. <laughs> Not bad either. <laughs> so one of the reasons we invited Dr. Noonan is because he has first-hand experience at teaching both English language learners and graduate-level programs using Internet technology. And the title of his presentation yesterday was... ELT curriculum, IT, and autonomy, three of the main themes in contemporary language teaching uh, designs. Yesterday you did an overview of curriculum from three, three different perspectives. perspectives. Yes, yes. And the first one was the traditional approach. Right, the curriculum is plan. Right. Uh, would you overview the second two because some of our folks might not have seen that. Okay. So that's the, tra the, the traditional view of a curriculum is, it, is it's a document or a set of documents and resources uh, that are used to guide the instructional process. So a syllabus traditionally contains specifications of content, the grammar you have to teach, the functions that are associated with the grammar, the sequencing of those items and so on. Um, it'll include teaching materials, assessment instruments, and so on. All of that kind of upfront work that you do to uh, to create a program prior to actually going into the classroom. Um, and for many people, that's what curriculum. That's the, the beginning, the middle, and the end of curriculum. I've tried to suggest that in fact there are at least two other perspectives on curriculum. Uh, one, the second one is the curriculum uh, as action, and this is where this re this refers to the moment-by-moment by moment realities of the classroom itself, where we go into the classroom and then we, tr we breathe life into the curriculum as plan. And the point that I was trying to make yesterday is that the curriculum in action, or the curriculum as action, will be different from the curriculum as plan. We transform what we do in the classroom on a moment-by-moment -moment basis on many ways. And so if you recorded, uh, took a video recording of my lessons or your lessons, and you then compared, the, you, you then used the video as the database for 
reconstructing the curriculum, you would get a very different view, view of curriculum from if you just did an inspection of the documents, the syllabuses and the, the materials and so on. Just as when we look at our, our teaching plan for any given lesson and then we look at the end of, a, end of the day, we varied widely. Yeah, we'll be in, in very different places. And what's, what's very interesting to me is to look at, um, I, I did a classroom-based study quite a few years ago now looking at teachers' interactive decision-making. Um, I went in and sat, ha got their lesson plan, sat in the lesson, videotaped their lesson. I then talked them through the lesson at the end of the, of, of the day and I got them to, to focus on those points where they did something that they hadn't been planning to do and then probed to find out why they made those kinds of decisions and, uh, and that was an interesting process as well. But then the third dimension is the curriculum as outcome and this is, if, this is looking now not at what uh, the curriculum developer and materials writer plans or intends, not at what the teacher and learners do in the class, but what learners actually acquire as a result of taking part in classroom learning. This would be, how would we prepare for this? How would we design how would a curriculum? How would you document it, do you mean? Um, I, I, at the beginning of the semester, we have to put something down on paper. Right. How could we outline what we, an, would it be just what we anticipate the learners developing this new is the, skills? This is coming back to the curriculum as plan. Yes. Well, but right. At, but at the, for most of us, at the, end of the, at the beginning of the semester, we need to put something down on paper. Right. And so would option three, the outcomes, not be available beforehand? Would we project no, outcomes? They, they, or? they would not. We could project outcomes, and they would be enshrined in classroom tests and so on, which would, in designing a classroom test, we would make assumptions about what we assume uh, learners are going to, uh, going to acquire as a result of doing our courses. But of course, again, just as there's no neat one-to-one -one relationship between the plans that we have and what we do in the classroom, there isn't a very neat relationship between what we do in the classroom and what learners acquire. Right. The, the equation, they're obvious that there has to be a relation, otherwise there wouldn't be any point in, in us doing anything, but the relationship is not, is not a simple one-to-one -one, uh, relationship. And so if you took a set of curriculum documents from, from my, my centre, videos of my teaching and then samples of my learner language, these would all be three different kinds of curriculum artefacts and they would each provide you with a different perspective on the complexities of the teaching and learning in, in the situation that I work. At the same time, yesterday during the program, you, you did a lot of work, uh, a lot of screen projections right. of various web-based documents, forms, right, and activities right. that, your, that your learners are doing in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, how can we as teachers outside of Hong Kong develop such a, a scheme? It looked like there were hundreds of hours of development in that. There is, although increasingly there are user-friendly and free-to-air software sources that you can draw on to develop your own kinds of questionnaires and so on. Uh, the point that I was making yesterday was that uh, I don't see IT as replacing uh, regular classroom instruction but helping us to do what we do more effectively. Uh, one of the examples that I gave was um, in a traditional approach, one of the important steps is to uh, create pedagogical goals that make sense to the learners. Right. Um, and communicating those goals yeah, effectively. And then, and then gradually helping learners to set their own goals. The, the, progr the program that I demonstrated yesterday takes the learners through, a s it's web-based, it takes the learners through a series of steps that results in their own, their own learning plan. And that's part of the autonomy aspect of... Well, I mean, doing that is an, is, is, an, is an aspect of autonomy. If you actually go through and create a learning plan for yourself, and if you say, well, I want to develop my speaking, interactional speaking skills, I want to be able to talk on a, a wide range of subjects with native speakers and others, that is, that is a very... That, a person who makes that kind of statement is in a very different place in terms of autonomy than someone who says... Teacher, teach me. Yeah, yeah, I don't know what I want, just teach me. Um, and and uh, by having it web-based, it means the students can work on it in their own time, but they can also update it regularly. And as you saw, the, the program itself places a date and a time on each, on each plan because it then automatically refreshes that plan when the students update their, their learning plans. One of the things we've seen in the literature and you alluded to yesterday is that uh, technology seems to be used most frequently in writing courses. Where, 
you're not a, a technology technology geek. That's right, not your right, forte. Right. But uh, from what you've seen and the places you've been, how do you see it growing from there? One of the difficult things, one, I think one of the challenges for, for technology and internet-based um, products to augment what we do in the classroom is uh, the provision of feedback to learners. So the provision of feedback in terms of speaking and also in terms of writing. Uh, the way that I've done that is that um, I have a, um, a rather nice resource in both of these areas. One of them is designed to um, help students do uh, take part in interviews. You know, for example, if they're doing the IELTS test, right. one of the things they have to do is to do a structured interview. Uh, in many walks of life and in many situations, being able to take part in an interview in English is very important in the education field and the employment field. Uh, what I've done is to videotape a number of model interviews, or they're, they're real interviews with, with second language learners uh, that I've placed on the websites. The students, what the students can do is to view these as, as, as models. They then do their own interview where the, 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 quest, the interviewer asks the questions and they then audio tape their responses. Once again, they're stored on the server and they can then compare their, their interview with the original. There's then a checklist of criterial questions that they can then work through to evaluate their, their, own. their own. And the same with writing. Um, uh, the students uh, look at some uh, writing models, they complete a writing assignment, they evaluate the writing assignment against sets of criteria and they then compare their writing assignment with some model, some model assignments that have been pa placed on the on the server. You've mentioned that IT is not to replace the teacher, at least not in the immediate short term. How much of this work that we're describing takes place during what are during the classroom hours, during what's customarily considered to be the, the teacher learner interface? I try. And what I th the point that I would like to make is that I think that um, technology can allow that allow teachers to do more creative stuff, um, not doing less work but actually doing more more of the creative and less of the... I don't see much need, for example, with lower p level learners these days in having them doing um, lots and lots of drills. You know, the, the teacher is a drill master in a class, I think, is, is uh, of limited value. And th those, that kind of drill-based practice is something that uh, technology can do very well because it's very patient. And students, particularly in, in Asian contexts, where very often they're reticent to speak out in, in public until they're quite confident, they can do that in the privacy of a language lab or their own homes um, and get that intensive repetitive practice that we know is important for language acquisition, but which, can, quite frankly, is often fairly tedious and, as far as I'm concerned, a bit of a waste of time in class. Well, one of the things we're seeing nowadays is that in a lot of schools, the classroom, the computer connected classroom is used for precisely those tasks right. and there's little demand for students to do work outside of class. Right. That the teacher becomes a uh, an IT technician, is your computer working okay and are you working busily? Right. Uh, especially in some schools where students carry 20 or 21 classroom hours in a right. week. Right. Uh, we, it, it seems like it's Redirecting the energy of the teacher to being a, uh, you know, a low-level clerk, somebody who yes. can just basically make sure the computers are on and, yeah. and functioning. Yeah. yeah. What's the, what's the future of this? Are we looking at at reducing the amount of classroom hours and considering out-of-classroom computer work time as learning time? That's one option, um, and certainly that's in some of the. Uh, I've just I've recently had um, some fairly large cuts to my budget, which means that I won't be able to employ as many teachers next year. And in order to maintain the amount of contact that students have with English, one option for me is to is is to deploy technology. So we've got a number of multimedia uh, language labs on campus. One possibility for me, for example, is instead of having is instead of uh, doubling the amount of teaching that I do. Uh, say if I if I've got a Typically, we teach two or three hour classes a week. What I can do is instead of having 20 students for three hours, I can have um, 40 students, 20 of them going to the uh, MMLC for 90 minutes. With it while I'm sorry, what's that acronym? Uh, multimedia La uh, Language Center. Uh, Self access center type thing? Or? Well, no, it's, it's similar to this where all of the machines are um, 
presumably they're all connected to the internet, they're all connected with each other and so on. Um, so half of the students basically are working in this kind of uh, self-access mode. Mm -hmm. uh, the other half are working with me, and then half, after 90 minutes they swap. So I do a repeat 90-minute lesson rather than with, with 20 students rather right. than a three-hour lesson uh, with 40 students. And then you spend some of your non-teaching time checking their work. Yeah, or very often, I, yes. Yeah. Uh, and again, you know, I'll, ha I'll have someone... Uh, Typically what I do is to employ uh, student helpers, uh, mm -hmm. often students who are um, uh, computing uh, science majors at the university, and um, they always appreciate uh, a little extra money, and so uh, they come in and they'll act as the, as the, the, the kind of... The technician, the, technician, the lab assistant. The lab so. assistant, yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've been on the air for 20 minutes, is that right? And we've not had any information coming through. I'm not sure if we're having a technology problem. Uh, the, but the forum looks like it's working. We just haven't heard from you. So we've got Dr. Noonan for about 10 more minutes. He's got to jump on a plane to head back to Hong Kong. So we're a little worried that we're not offering you an opportunity to communicate. We do have a few folks in the room here with us. And if there's any questions, we'd like to just offer the mic. I'm wondering about your experience with this kind of thing, mm -hmm. uh, where the webcasting is available, uh, and on the serving side, things are working. But on the, the interactive side, the receiving side, my experience has been that the reception is always less than I'd like and less than I, I would suspect. Oh, Sarah. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't fall. I didn't fall to the floor. Well, <laughs> well, things things on the technical side go less than perfectly, but yeah. but they go all right. Yeah. But but the reception on the internet, mm. both in the educational community and in general, has been much smaller than I would have expected. Why do you think that is? And how can what we do you mean by reception? The, for example, that right now we're talking to Dr. David Noonan, a, a, right. a leading AFL professional. We we're webcasting to some private groups. We're also webcasting publicly. And not that many people are tuning in. Mm. I don't think that's a reflection. On, I think there's a lot of people who would love to be participating right now. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm sure publicity is a factor, but there still seems to be hesitance on the, the listener side of things. Yeah, I think it's possibly the, um, yeah, the, 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 just the drop-in factor probably isn't, um, isn't, isn't the most effective way of going. I'm, in fact, next week running a... Uh, taking part in an in an interactive. This will be. It won't be voice chat. It'll be it'll be text chat. Uh, that's run through the TESOL Association through their professional development. Um, they have uh, online courses, and I think the most successful ones in my experience are the ones where they have they are structured in some way. Even if it's a one-off event, where the individuals beforehand receive something to read or react to, or some uh, some website to visit um, and do something. And so that they're then set up for uh, for the experience. Uh, recently, I ran a, a five-day training session for a group of uh, voice chat hosts. These are teachers who are being trained to facilitate conversation classes through uh, voice chat. And again, um, getting a commitment from them, giving them a, a more structured program, resulted in much more effective buy-in from the, the participants themselves, and it turned out to be quite good. And I've had some, somewhat of a similar experience as a learner, right. uh, participating in a couple of programs where they had a one-week preparation, you had to pre-register, and they had a 30-minute training course where you went through all the, the little functions. And it was terribly boring, but then when we actually went live, it worked. And I believe we do have a question from the Internet. Is that right? Oh, from the room. Dr. Newton, it's nice to meet you. Uh, I, I teach at a university, and we have 27 teachers, mm -hmm. and I've tried to um, get people um, to use the website that I've created to post homework or, or be a link for mm -hmm. all the students. Um, I haven't had much luck. In three years that I've been um, putting up a website um, and offering some workshops, um, there have been few takers, right. and uh, only this year when I said, "Look, you give me a diskette with your homework, and I'll mm. I'll post it for you." Right. Now I have 75% of the people right. using it. Yeah. 
How, how do I get people to I've use had it? a similar experience. I suppose that I'm in a slightly more fortunate position because I'm the chair professor of the department and so therefore, you know, <laughs> I have ways of getting people excited, <laughs> like withholding their salary check. <laughs> no, just a joke. I hope none of my staff are watching this. Um, but, yeah, well, I, I hope they are, but... Um, I have a number of strategies. First of all, I accept that I'll never get 100% buy-in, you know, that there are certain people... Teachers are scared of the stuff and... I think what we have to show, show them is the, va the added value to, uh, to doing this. So I will work on things that I know they have to do, which, and I know that I can show them how to add value. For example, last semester, our student evaluation of teaching forms, that's a hugely cumbersome operation. You know, I've got 45 teachers and 4,000 students, and each of them has to do, an, you know, evaluations. And so if a teacher's got... Um, 14 classes of 20 students, that's a huge amount of, just amount of paperwork. Um, so we've put all that online, they have to do that online. They have to submit their, um, their student grades online at the end of semester. Um, there's a bit of a learning curve when they have to learn how to do it, but we've got a program basically using um, uh, a version of Excel, which is user friendly. And once the, once the teachers have been through the process once and see that it's reduced the amount of time by a third, then they then I start to get buy-in. Uh, another thing that I'm do going to be doing from next semester is to say that uh, the 10,000 kilos of photocopied materials that get produced uh, will not happen. I've, I've taken that out of my budget line. If they want, to, what they have to do is to put their materials on the web to be downloaded by the students. And yeah. so, and my university here in Korea is doing the same thing. Yeah. Uh, if students want to see their final grades then they have to do the faculty evaluation online and then they can see their grade online. There's no more printouts. Uh, faculty are, are pushed to not do handouts. Uh, the photocopy budget has been cut to the bare bones and we're told uh, make the students do the printouts. Uh, if they want the handout, they have to have it themselves. It becomes a problem though when you want to use that handout in your classroom for a specific purpose right. And you know that there's a given percentage of students who just won't. Mm. Yeah. I have the same problem. What, what I've done is I've, I find a, a plastic sleeve and I put the handout in it and I reuse it in all my classes, right. cut down on the paper. Right. Um, uh, the other thing I was going to ask you is right now our students submit their homework on paper. They print it out. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering if you know of any program where the students could uh, submit through email and the program would allow us to do some uh, marking uh, easily and send it to them, plus keep track of... Uh, yeah, I never have hard copy uh, written assignments handed in now. They're always, a, they're always submitted as word attachments and I, do, I evaluate them uh, using the, uh, the comment function, insert comment function of, of Word uh, and send it back to them. Um, online. Sure, and, and nowadays pretty much students can get an email address anywhere, so it's not, it's not an issue. There's so many free ad addresses in almost well, every country. Yeah, well, all of, all of our students automatically get an email account when they register. They also get a, an IBM notebook computer, so there's... Oh, no, well. We have uh, 14,000 uh, 14, internet access points all around the campus, you know, in the cafeteria, uh, and so there's absolutely no excuse. In fact, we're going wireless now, so most of the campus is wireless. Can I work there? <laughs> uh, we are down to about two minutes, so... I'm sorry, Dr. Noonan, I was actually not able to attend your presentation yesterday because I was down here and I'm going to be uh, watching it online tomorrow. I'm also teaching in Korea, uh, teaching at a university, and I'm using forums uh, similar to the, the Korea Bridge forums uh, in my classrooms for my first year students to practice using English. Um, what I'm wondering, in, in those forums, what they have the opportunity to do is to communicate with each other um, with the English that they've got. Right. Uh, I don't edit the forms particularly strongly. Um, what I'm wondering is what would you do, uh, what would you suggest to supplement uh, those in terms of I'm wary of entrenching email or chat versions of English at the same time. Uh, while I think they have a useful place, I'm not sure that they are entirely sufficient unto themselves. 
Um, what would you recommend to supplement those forms? So I'm not quite sure exactly. You, when you say forms... Uh, post and reply, post and reply. Oh, okay, right, right, right. Yeah, chat forms, yeah. essentially. Yeah, I mean... Um, and it's a great system. Yeah. So it's like it's a form of bulletin board. Essentially. Yeah. And so yeah. why why are you doing that? Is it to... Uh, to have them, it's a conversation class, and okay. getting Korean students to speak in class is a bit difficult. Yeah. Um, so this is practice in conversing uh, in written format. So it's a t it's text chat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Again, I made a comment in my plenary yesterday that I th I thought that there were a lot of people have been very critical and have said, well, you know, text chat is totally different from voice chat. Um, mm which it is, but I think that there could be some potential benefits to, to text chat. The learners have longer processing time mm -hmm. and they still have to put the, the language together in their heads. They still have to activate the structures that they've got. Um, so I, I could see some potential benefits. I've got a doctoral student uh, who's actually looking at this. She's got three groups set up. Uh, they're, all, they're all from a conversation class. One of them is doing uh, the pedagogical tasks face to face, one doing it through text chat and one doing it through voice chat. Mm -hmm. She's recording all three and she's then going to be analysing the discourse of these three different modes of, uh, of communication. I think that will be, that Very that interesting. Will be quite interesting. Yeah. So I think, I think the response is, well, I don't, you know, it's not, it's not appropriate uh, for everything. I mean, the way that I would I, do, I agree. the way that I would do what you're doing is to, to give them, to give them a, to have a multi-phase set of tasks so phase one would be like the the warm-up or the pre-task or the setting up task and I'd get them doing that and I'd make sure that that incorporated some of the target language that they were going to need when they did when they did the, mm -hmm. the in-class or the face-to-face -face tasks I'd get them working through and completing that task and at the next class meeting they would then do the do the class um, as uh, as per normal okay thanks yeah. very much And we're just out of time. It's been our great pleasure to have with us Dr. David Noonan of the University of Hong Kong, who is simply one of the most prolific writers and presenters available on the planet. And we really appreciate that you made the time to come to this conference, particularly for this webcast. And hope to see you again real soon. Next year would Absolutely. not be too long away. Thank Thanks, you very Rob. much. My pleasure.